Hello and welcome to Rehab Reels, Conversations on Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, hosted by Dr. Gwen Soa. My name is Andy Ziegler with the University of Pittsburgh and UPMC. I'd like to welcome everyone joining us today for a special presentation on advances in sports medicine with Dr. Kentaro Onishi. Our series host, Dr. Gwendolyn Soa, is the endowed professor and chair of the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and is the director of the UPMC Rehabilitation Institute. She holds joint appointments in the Departments of Orthopedic Surgery and Bioengineering and has served as a clinician scientist in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation for over 15 years. Our featured guest is Dr. Kantaro Onishi. Dr. Onishi is an assistant professor for the Departments of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation and Orthopedic Surgery at the University of Pittsburgh. He serves as director of the UPMC Sports Medicine Fellowship, the Sports Ultrasound Summit, and Musculoskeletal Ultrasound Innovation. His clinical practice and research focuses on non-surgical treatments of sports injuries using ultrasound technologies. Dr. Onishi regularly presents at national and international conferences and his research team received the prestigious J. Leonard Goldner Award at this year's American Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Society annual meeting. He also works with the International Olympic Committee medical research team and is the lead investigator for a project for the 2021 Tokyo Olympics, where he aims to use ultrasound as the first line diagnostic imaging modality. Dr. So and Dr. Onishi, thank you so much for being with us today. Dr. Soa, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Andy, and it's it's truly a pleasure to have uh, many of you back, uh, hopefully again for our, our rehab reels, and hopefully some of you are new to join us, and it'll be, uh, you'll be in for a real treat tonight. So Dr. Onishi is, is um, an absolute dynamo. Uh, he is what we refer to as an academic triple threat with excellence in clinical care, education, as well as research. I think as you'll hear tonight, his enthusiasm for science is absolutely contagious, um, as is his boundless energy to care for and advocate for the patients that he takes care of. He's also highly sought after as an educator um, locally, nationally, and even internationally, hosting international conferences here um, in Pittsburgh, uh, as well as regularly being asked to do workshops around the world. And he's also an innovator, bringing rigorous science and new technologies um, to, to fruition in the clinics and thinking about new ways to approach musculoskeletal conditions so we can continue to push the boundaries of the way that we care for patients with musculoskeletal conditions. His involvement, as you'll hear a little bit about tonight with the International uh, Olympic Committee, I think will stand to not only benefit patients and athletes, but sport in general um, and the field on a much larger scale. So he literally lives and breathes his work. He's an avid runner himself, and he has firsthand understanding of, of both the goals that patients have to get back to their sport and back to their activity and some of the frustrations that they go through. And so I think he can really uh, speak to that and, and have some um, uh, ability to have both empathy and credibility with his patients. So I know you're going to enjoy his talk tonight. Uh, so I'll turn the floor over to Dr. Anishi. And we look forward to a robust discussion at the end and as we all look for ways to stay active during this particularly challenging time. Thank you, Gwen. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Rona, for setting this rehab real session for me tonight. Uh, once again, uh, my name is Kentaro Onishi from University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, Department of Physical Medicine Rehabilitation, or PMR, and Department of Orthopedic Surgery. And tonight, um, um, I'll, uh, I'll be speaking to you about advances in sports medicine. Um, just quickly, um, I, I do receive a grant support from the Department of Defense, American Medical Society for Sports Medicine and the Pit Innovation Challenge, but none of the contents for the today's presentation is influenced uh, by these grants. Uh, but I just wanted to have a full disclosure before I get started. And also before I get started, I just wanted to thank you, uh, everyone who was able to join my presentation tonight. Um, uh, I know that it's a busy time, evening times, family times, so really appreciate your uh, participation and um, um, interest. Uh, before I get started, I, I wanted to uh, briefly kind of introduce myself a little bit more. Uh, little known fact about myself is I was um, um, 
born and raised in uh, Tokyo, Japan until age 21, when I somehow decided to come across the uh, uh, Pacific Ocean to uh, uh, become a sports medicine physician in America. Everyone thought I was crazy, but um, that's kind of what I live off of, uh, to be different and unique. Uh, so I came here uh, to California and uh, completed my undergraduate degree at Pepperdine University out in Malibu, California, beautiful place. Most recently trained uh, at Mayo Clinic Rochester uh, under the uh, likes of Dr. Jake Sellen, Dr. Jay Smith, and Dr. Jonathan Finoff, who is now the Chief Medical Officer for Team USA Olympics, um, um, uh, to master the uh, uh, sports medicine as well as the ultrasound skill used in sports medicine, as I will be able to share with you tonight. My current role uh, includes uh, assistant professor role at the Department of Physical Medicine Rehabilitation as well as orthopedic surgery as my secondary appointment. I serve as a team physician for Division I uh, Athletics at Duquesne University. As I, uh, Andrew shared with you, I also um, work as a director of sports medicine fellowship in order to train the future generation of sports medicine physicians. And finally, I was recently appointed as a musculoskeletal ultrasound innovation director for the Department of PMR as well as orthopedic surgery. And um, the role is to really um, uh, continue to innovate new and exciting related to sports ultrasound uh, through research as I will be able to share with you tonight. I spend about half of my time uh, doing research, both clinical as well as bench research. Uh, which I'll be able to touch upon in my second half of my presentation, which might be more of an interest for clinical uh, medical uh, um, special um, med medical uh, experts. But my, um, as far as my clinical practice goes, uh, my practice is unique in that I use ultrasound to help diagnose and treat athletic injuries um, in my clinics. Also, because I'm a runner, as Gwen shared with you, I tend to see lots of endurance athletes in my clinics and runners. As a result, I developed a keen interest in taking care of patients with overuse tendon injuries using my ultrasound skill. For those of you who may not be familiar with sports ultrasound, sports ultrasound is not just to look at the babies. Uh, the same technology can be used in sports medicine to look at tendons, muscles, ligaments, joints, and nerves, in addition to traditional clinical examinations in the clinics, now to better understand your injuries. This is actually my two-year-old trying to perform the diagnostic ultrasound on my wife's knee several nights ago. Anyways, so in what way can ultrasound help sports injury evaluation? One is to use it to guide conventional procedures performed commonly in sports medicine clinics. In most clinics in the United States today, many injections such as steroid injections are still being performed without a guidance. This is what we call blind injection. Blind injection is quick to perform, but unfortunately it may not account for individual anatomic differences. As a result, we, we know uh, when compared to ultrasound guided injection, blind injections is less accurate in the scale of anywhere between 20 to 100% accuracy difference. For example, this top right corner is showing a conventional shoulder joint injection done without guidance. And right bottom corner is showing left side is outside of the shoulder, right side is inside in, toward the center of the body. And the needle is coming from the outside of the shoulder into the shoulder joint. And you can even see the injected material going into the shoulder joint. Uh, between the two injection methods, there's about 60% accuracy difference. Um, so you know, this, this is one way that um, ultrasound can help uh, improve clinical sports medicine practice. But where ultrasound is really most helpful in my view is our ability to see through the skin to help characterize the injuries the athletes and patients suffer. As you know, old adage says, seeing is believing. I will show you what I mean by this using one uh, case presentation. So this was a case of an avid runner who fell on a black ice. 
uh, those runners who may be on with us tonight, uh, we know the fear of running onto the black ice and falling onto this. But in this uh, lady's case, uh, she fell and developed a painful snapping hip, as you can see from this gross video. If your hip moves like this, uh, this is not normal, just so you know. Um, and as conventionally done for evaluation of this particular lady and a patient, MRI was ordered and MRI was not really helpful because we are trying to evaluate dynamic phenomenon of snapping the hip using a static imaging modality, which is MRI. So then we proceeded to perform what we call dynamic real-time ultrasound. For those of you who are not familiar with ultrasound image, this is ultrasound probe placed on the uh, sit bone called the ischial tuberosity, which is this IT. And this is what uh, the bone looks like on ultrasound. Bright signal looks like a mountain. And normally, hamstring tendon sits in this circle as a bright uh, structure. And of course, on top of that, toward the in top of the screen is the skin. So this is subcutaneous tissue. And then this is a gluteus muscle. So this is a hamstring tendon. As I start the video, watch to see uh, something that moves. And then this is hamstring tendon. Um, to the right side of the screen, hopefully uh, the face pictures or the zoom is not covering it. But um, as you can see, uh, the hamstring structure snaps onto the sit bone or ischial tuberosity. So in this particular case of snapping hip, ultrasound that was extremely instrumental in uncovering the uh, disease process and understanding this condition. This particular case was treated with surgical anchor uh, so that we can fix this hamstring tendon into where it belongs, which is the sit bone. Um, and this is how she looked like 12 weeks after the surgery. So the moment of truth is when she flexes the torso. See, she's no longer snapping. So um, this is one, uh, one case that highlights the benefit of using ultrasound to evaluate a patient who presents with sports injury that may have otherwise been difficult to understand and even make the executive decision to take this person to a surgery. So this is one example that highlights the benefit of ultrasound. MRI has been long the uh, sort of gold standard soft tissue imaging modality of choice in evaluation of sports injuries in many cases, but there are several advantages of ultrasound compared to MRI. As you saw, for example, compared to MRI, ultrasound um, is dynamic in real time. So if the injury is dynamic as often the case in sports injury. You probably hear the athletes complaining, I only have pain when I'm running, when I'm kicking the ball. Then ultrasound may offer additional insight that static image such as MRI cannot offer in the case that I recently presented. Also as a technology, ultrasound affords a higher spatial resolution in the scale of about four times compared to MRI. So if you're looking for subtle injuries, Perhaps ultrasound offers added benefit due to increased spatial resolution. Ultrasound is also wallet friendly, so to speak, and cost effective. One publication out of Thomas Jefferson University uh, shows that if we are to substitute ultrasound for uh, MRI diagnosis that could have been made just simply using ultrasound over a 16 year period of time, a single hospital would have saved $6.2 billion in healthcare dollar cost. So it's cost saving. And finally, ultrasound is far more portable and why is it disadvantageous? As Gwen alluded, I'm a project lead uh, for venue ultrasound program during Tokyo, it says 2020, now it's 2021. As Dr. Uh, Mr. Thomas Bach announced yesterday uh, in relation to the Tokyo Olympics, um, Tokyo Olympics will happen uh, in uh, July of 2021. 
Um, and I'm pretty excited about it because I was involved in uh, conception of this um, venue ultrasound program, which is a joint effort by physicians from University of Pittsburgh in USA, as well as physicians from Canada, Japan, as well as Norway. And the purpose of this um, uh, venue ultrasound is using the advantage of ultrasound being portable to have um, the ultrasound available at each competition stadiums and venues so that as athletes get injured and go down, we have uh, imaging capability to um, add on to the assessment traditionally done on the sight line or rocker room to better understand and improve the triage process of athletic injury. As a graduate from uh, University of Irvine School of Medicine, I'm also excited to share that the University of California Irvine School of Medicine became the first medical school in the nation last year to offer a personal ultrasound device to all the medical students to the day one, uh, on the day one of the medical school. I hope this uh, movement in medical education illustrates uh, well that the ultrasound technology is advancing the provision of patient care both from sports medicine perspective but also from the perspective of the entire medical field. I believe there's some consideration for a similar plan at University of uh, Pittsburgh Medical Center School of Medicine as well uh, from the grapevine but um, I wanted to share this video with you uh, because um, this is pretty exciting from my perspective and for those who embrace ultrasound in sports medicine practice. The UCI School of Medicine has been uh, very innovative since its beginning. It, when I first saw the butterfly device, I was blown away and I said, we have to give one of these to each of our students on day one. Seeing the physiology come alive enables students to actively learn the wonders of the human body. At UC Irvine, you guys graduate with special powers that uh, most other medical students don't have. And that's becoming your reputation. When people see a UCI medical student coming along, they think, oh, that person is going to be able to not just do a history and a physical exam, but they're going to actually be able to look into the body, through the entire body, from the eyeballs all the way down to the heel of the foot, using harnessing this technology. So yeah, we're seeing basically four chamber view of the heart here. You can see all four chambers there. The uh, ventricles are at the top of your screen. We put a lot of thought into how we can continue to drive innovation and quality in medical education. And came to the conclusion that ultrasound will play an integral role in the future of medicine. So with that thought, we decided that tonight, after you receive your white coat, we will present each of you with your own personal butterfly device. So congratulations, class of 2023. You were the first class in the nation to have their own personal ultrasound device. You are the future. Embrace it and go forward with enthusiasm and passion. Having ultrasound this early in my practice is really going to help my education. I was blown away by receiving this butterfly gift. For me, ultrasound in practice is going to be completely game changing because I am really passionate about delivering health care to low resource settings and they don't have things like this. This white coat ceremony has been by far one of the most meaningful nights of my life. I'm just deeply grateful to have the opportunity to have my family here tonight to show them just how far all of their hard work has allowed me to go thus far. And I'm ready to start walking this butterfly which is top device and, and save some lives. Pretty exciting, isn't it? I'll shift the gear a little bit um, and talk about this uh, tendinopathy or tendon injury. One of the areas that saw a significant change in sports medicine field with ultrasound technology is the management of tendon injuries, also known as tendinopathy. For those of you who are not familiar with tendinopathy, tendinopathy refers to debilitating painful conditions for tendons uh, that are associated with pain and swelling with a tendency for recurrence and chronic changes. Just like other painful condition, um, chronic tendinopathy can turn a very active person 
to be very inactive due to pain. It was a potential for development of secondary conditions such as weight gain and other metabolic diseases as a result of decreased activity levels. With increased longevity uh, in the United States, the aggregate total expenditure for musculoskeletal disease had more than doubled over the past 10 uh, decade period or 10 year period or decade. According to a recent report, tendinopathy comprises as much as 30% of uh, musculoskeletal injury visits to primary care physicians and accounts for 50% of sports injuries, resulting in an estimated 16.5 million cases per year uh, in the United States alone. It is also important to note that tendinopathy is uh, one of the main reasons for retirement from a professional athletic career. So tendinopathy is a major concern for both active individuals as well as to the, uh, our society. Rest assured, good news is the University of Pittsburgh Sports Medicine provides cutting edge uh, treatment for patients with tendon injuries, and we have attracted patients locally as well as globally. Tanith Maxwell, um, for example, is a South African Olympic marathon runner who came to us from Cape Town, only 37 hour flight for our care for her Achilles tendon injury. This is a publicly available information, so it doesn't violate uh, the uh, patient confidentiality uh, issues. Because we used ultrasound as part of her evaluation, we were able to assess right on the first visit how severe her tendon injury is right on the spot and provided the much needed care for uh, in a timely fashion instead of extending her stay in the United States, waiting for an MRI. Because ultrasound, another advantage of ultrasound is that it shows as much of a soft tissue structures injuries in, uh, sports, uh, in the sports medicine, ultrasound today allows us to perform more involved semi-surgical procedures in office setting. This includes what was traditionally performed in operated room, for Tannis Maxwell, we performed what we call ultrasound guided tendon scraping. And she was able to go for a six mile run with me the very next day, as you can see from her Twitter account. Um, I will share, spare the details of tendon scraping as it's um, easily uh, searchable using online search engine. If you type tendon scraping, maybe University of Pittsburgh, then you'll come across several um, you know, online articles explaining the details of the procedure. Um, but this is a procedure that may allow for a quick return to activities for those individuals who are on the go. We also offer another ultrasound guided tendon procedure called percutaneous ultrasonic tenotomy, also known as TENEX, which aims to remove the scar tissue. As you can see from the right top corner, this is a special device that we have, uh, scar tissue um, removal as an outpatient procedure without needing that more of like involved a traditional surgical procedure that requires general anesthesia. Another highlight of University of Pittsburgh Medical Center is uh, we have Dr. James Swain, who is a PhD scientist here at our university. He has spent the last 25 years investigating how tendon um, responds to uh, stress and how tendon sometimes fails to heal. As a sports medicine physician, Dr. Wayne's research and his foresight allowed me to provide ever so sensitive care for the tendon injuries. One of our recent works has shown that tendon is not as inactive, homogeneous, uniform structure as it was once thought, but rather our soon to be published manuscript and his work has shown that two of the tendon subpopulation cells known as paratenone and endotenone or intrafascicular matrix are in fact metabolically active and contribute to tendon injury related pain. Whereas the remaining one component known as fascicle is in fact metabolically inactive and provides uh, important structural support. Um, this study informs us that the treatment targeted to improve structural support or fascicle looks may not be enough, but rather we may need to start thinking that improving tendon pain and improving tendon strength are two separate goals 
in treating tendon injuries. So Dr. Wayne's work uh, and our work together has informed me to start seeing tendon injuries differently than without his work. So I'm very fortunate to be working with him. Having this, this kind of understanding about biology of the tendon allows us to better interpret available clinical literature. If you look at um, the platelet-rich plasma um, injection and clinical literature, and I have to explain what platelet-rich plasma is for those people who may not be familiar with this, but platelet-rich plasma is an injection of your own platelets uh, that is concentrated, uh, used to repair injured tendons or other tissues in sports medicine. If you look at our recently published review with colleagues from around the country, then tendon clinical trials are truly 50-50, where half of the studies show the benefits, while the other half fails to show benefits beyond the placebo. But, what, uh, but with what I just presented about tendon cell suburb population and our improved understanding, we might better be able to explain the current 50-50% situations. Traditionally, animal studies uh, and researchers in animal studies focused on improving tendon integrity, aka fascicle, and how it looks like, but not so much about pain. Whereas clinical studies, because our patients typically present with pain as a chief complaint, had a focus on the pain as opposed to that how the tendon integrity function uh, and how tendon functions. So. Um, there might be discrepancy uh, between animal studies that looks great, promising, whereas a clinical study looks 50-50 because maybe we're looking uh, at two different facets of tendon injury, one focusing on pain and its improvement, whereas animal studies are uh, trying to focus on how tendon looks like. So, um, you know, uh, understanding the biology of tendon by doing research allows us to uh, better appreciate available clinical literature, literature and why it's so um, different from the animal studies. This is another ongoing exciting investigation I wanted to share with you, as this paper was just published over this past weekend. In this study, we had investigated the use of metformin, a commonly used diabetic medication to show that metformin prevents tendon disease formation. If we can prevent tendon injuries from happening, clearly that would be the best for our patients and athletes so they can stay active and do not have to spend time and resources to receive the care for tendon injuries. In this particular study, half of the mice in, involved in the study was treated with metformin, while the other half uh, underwent a treadmill exercise called intense treadmill running without the treatment with metformin. And as you can see from the second, from the last, um, 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 last um, uh, picture here, this is the group that underwent treadmill exercise without the metforming group. And right over here, uh, hopefully uh, you can see it, but it looks just like the control groups here. So the group treated with metforming injection prior to, um, treadmill exercise um, showed um, sort of much better looking tendon than uh, those who simply underwent intense treadmill exercise, showing that metformin can prevent tendon degeneration from happening. So thinking ahead, we have formulated a metformin lotion that can achieve the same tissue concentration in tendon to see if we can use this lotion to prevent tendon injuries in human. So what we look to do next is to see if this metformin lotion can prevent tendon injuries from happening, although that might mean me needing to look for a new job without any tendon injuries coming to my clinic. So there might be some job security issues there if that ever happens, but nonetheless, this is pretty exciting. So in conclusion, Sports ultrasound revolutionized care for athletes with the ability for a timely diagnosis beyond traditional imaging and clinical examinations. And by allowing for innovation in microinvasive treatment options that are safe and accurate. 
with backup of basic sciences and with our ultrasound experiences, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center is uniquely positioned to further improve cares for patients suffering from tendon injuries. And I'm particularly excited about metformin lotion project. Um, thank you so much for your um, attention. And this uh, is about uh, what I have got for today's presentation. And thank you so much for your time. Uh, here's my contact as well as contact for um, Andrew Ziegler who organized this uh, rehab we all. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Kentaro. That was that was awesome um, and exciting to see all these new advances. As people are thinking of questions, go ahead and populate them in the, in the Q and A section. But maybe I can start with a, a question or two while we're waiting for people to think of their questions. Um, you know, you talked about the handheld devices for medical students, and that is super exciting. And and yeah, we we definitely are. Um, uh, this is something that we're exploring extensively at Pitt, and I know there's been enthusiasm from our new dean of getting these in the hands of our, our medical students as well. Um, what, if anything, do you see as a barrier to um, getting these in the hands of medical students and, and having them use them as an adjunct to their anatomy teachings? I think that, uh, um, you know, um, learning experience needs to be in better. Ultrasound is interactive uh, skill. And the best learning takes place by having someone who's experienced teaching uh, live uh, to the students. And, you know, for the longest time, I think in the sports ultrasound, what was limiting was uh, the opportunities for learning for a physician who has full clinical practice after graduation from residency or training program. It was very difficult for them um, to close the clinic, be away from the family, to learn ultrasound, but um, with um, you know improved accessibility to the teaching thanks to coronavirus-related quarantine, now we have ways to uh, do live scan demonstration using a remote learning system. So um, as long as uh, we can improve that learning accessible, you know, accessibility to learning opportunities using different technologies. And as long as we also check off the mark of uh, having the enough available machines for students, I, I think that uh, the barrier will be uh, taken over. But then the traditional barrier was access to the learning uh, opportunities. But I think it's getting slowly better uh, because one thing I didn't have a chance to present uh, was uh, that you know, recently there's increased interest in improving remote teaching because now we can't meet in person and congregate in person. <laughs> so uh, we became very creative and we can do this thing called picture in picture learning, sort of like I said at Zoom, and you can have a screen on the corner and you can actually have another screen showing the pro positioning uh, so that we can kind of do um, sort of a step by step teaching even yeah. without being in the space. Yeah, it could facilitate learning in a lot of different in a lot of different settings. Absolutely, it's, it's exciting technology, and, and as everything else, it's eventually got to go handheld, right? So that's, that's exciting. Uh, so there's a question from uh, Michael, who's a fourth year medical student interested in musculoskeletal ultrasound, and um, he has a two part question. I'll start with the first one, Whoa. which is your your opinion on prolotherapy for I, I assume for primarily for tendon. So, sure. Uh, prolotherapy, for those of you who are not familiar with prolotherapy, is a simple injection of dextrose, which is an isomer for uh, glucose. And it's been used ever since 1937. The first description of medical use for uh, of dextrose for musculoskeletal condition was back in 1937 in, you know, from uh, Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine by Dr. Al Getney. Um, and ever since then, estimated over 400,000 uh, dextrose injection annually is performed in the United States. And it shows a very good success in terms of improvement of pain. Also, uh, side effect profile as it's shown to be extremely safe. How do we think it works? No one really knows. There's one uh, bench research that's done that shows injection of dextrose to uh, collagen, such as ligament or tendon structure, improves uh, the strengths of the soft tissue structure. So it may um, have to do with feeding local tissue the much needed energy source, which is the sugar. Everyone likes sugar. Um, so that may be one way. Um, and there's 
so many different um, sort of uh, theory behind this, how it might work. But this is a much needed area of, uh, and primed for research study um, because um, it's, like I said, commonly used with high side effect profile and it's nothing more than sugar injection. And based on my clinical experiences, um, it has worked far better, far longer, with a much less side effect than traditional steroid injection. Do you think there are subtleties to the patient and uh, selection for this that might help figure that out? It seems that this sugar or dextrose injection called the prolotherapy tends to work a chronically uh, painful tendon condition best. And I, I think that we need to study this. And I think, you know, based on James Wayne's study, looking at different tendon, you know, subpopulations seem like uh, it might have benefits to the part that is highly vascular. Mm -hmm. um, and it might actually do something to the uh, blood vessels within the tendon tissue. It might directly um, have influence on the nerve ending that is with inside the tendon tissue. There are so many ongoing theories, but it has been um, uh, interest of mine for a long time because Dr. Getney was the first person to describe it. The person who actually so sort of elevated this to a clinical skill set was Dr. Hemwell. And Dr. Hemwell trained two physicians, Dr. An Don Alderman and Dr. Ross Hauser, who is in Florida now. And Dr. Don Alderman was my mentor. So that's how I actually how I actually learned the skill, and that's how I incorporated this uh, dextrose injection. So I feel obliged. Now I have access to you know tendon laboratory here. Maybe I can finally put an explanation how this might work for tendon. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, Michael's second question is related to metformin, and of course this this kind of piggybacks with one of the questions I had uh, for you as well because. Metformin is getting a lot of attention in a lot of different disease processes, right? So it's uh, touted for its anti-aging properties, its anti-inflammatory properties, being treated or being used to treat all different types of conditions in all different formulations and delivery um, mechanisms. So it is very exciting. Maybe we'll put it in the water at some point, right? Um, sure. But uh, but Michael's question is about if you think this could have any effect on athletes' uh, euglycemic status if used because of its properties um, on glucose metabolism. So in addition to all of the other things, so do you think it has any effect on on um, blood glucose levels? That would enough be absorbed um, to affect that? And then the other part of the question would be, could you you know? Posit on, on on a potential mechanism as it relates to tendon. Yeah, so we have some good ideas of you know what the degree of systemic uh, effect will be, and you know when we were thinking about well, this seemed like a promising results based on the bench uh, animal studies. Uh, we want to study this in human, and there's one pathway where we'll give uh, human you know subjects oral uh, metformin, which then adds to the concern of systemic uh, effect, which is decreased sugar availability for athletes to perform at, you know, athletic feats. Mm -hmm. um, but what we are going after now is to use uh, the lotion form, which is locally applied. So if you're interested in, say if you're marathon runners training for the Olympic marathon trials, and you've had a previous history of Achilles tendonitis, and you want to prevent that from happening again during the training cycle, then uh, that person can consider applying this um, uh, sort of lotion over the Achilles tendon area. And um, at least based on animal studies, uh, lotion achieves the same local concentration as if you've ingested it by mouse without going around systemically to affect the uh, gl glucose availability for energy for, you know, athletics. Mm -hmm. um, and to answer the um, sort of question about how does metformin help prevent tendon injury from happening, uh, it seems that metformin uh, blocks the activity of this protein typically stored inside most cells called HMGB1. HMGB1, high mobility group box one, is um, upstream inflammatory molecule um, that is involved in uh, both, interestingly, 
regeneration, so repairing tissue and destruction of the tissue, depending on the oxidative state of the molecule. Um, when that HMGB1 is stored inside a cell, it's in the fully reduced form. And fully reduced HMGB1 recruits stem cell from the tendon. So the tendon specific stem cell gets attracted to the area when there's high concentration of HMGB1, which is beneficial if you're looking for repairing injury. But then once that uh, cell injury happens and the cell releases HMGB1 to outside of the cells, then it gets exposed to oxygen radicals and it will undergo oxygenation process. And once it gets oxidized, the oxidized form of HMGB1 now starts destroying the tissue around it. And metformin blocks oxidized version of HMGB1, thereby uh, improving healing ability thereby minimizing injury to the tendon is what we found out. And mm -hmm. so, you know, hopefully that answered your question, Michael and Gwen. <laughs> Thanks, there's a, there's a related question in the, in the chat um, uh, from George Penzak that um, asks about a dose response. Um, and if you've seen a dose response with the topical and uh, kind of related to that, any concerns? You mentioned not worrying too much about systemic absorption when using this topically, but any concerns at those higher doses of using this in a diabetic patient population, for example? Yeah, I think initially we are looking to, you know, uh, study this in sort of like a unhealthy individual without, you know, any other medical history. And, uh, you know, our hope is to start low and slow. And I think if you are to use a, uh, um, you know, lotion form as opposed to oral ingestion form, which is FDA approved for diabetes, then we have additional, you know, uh, sort of hoops to jump through. And we have to certainly conduct safety study. And in, in you know, conducting safety study, we'll start from a low dose, but we don't have the information right now as it applies to human and safety, what is the right dose? To prevent this. So that would be our next uh, step is to see in the small case um, sort of situations, we want to study what's the right dose and it, likely the right dose uh, is dependent upon um, the activity level of the person as well. Um, and there's a bunch of other components I'm sure that will influence the outcome. Um, but, um, you know, one, one, you know, uh, exciting things that we're doing with coronavirus related research, uh, as well as, you know, this particular research that we just discussed about metformin is repurposing the drugs that's already being around. Um, so I, I thought that this was an interesting idea to share. And, you know, that paper that I briefly talked about uh, with metformin preventing uh, Achilles tendon injury from happening uh, in the mice model, um, that was actually, took, uh, that took a notice by uh, American uh, Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Society. And then we received the Jay Goldner Award for it as Andy shared it with you earlier. So it's not just us who are excited about it, but also some society thought that this was, you know, uh, innovative and worth of, uh, you know, award, so. Yeah, yeah, so it, it sounds like at this stage, there's no reason to be concerned about diabetic versus non-diabetic patients, but um, the question arose, about pediatric patients from Kate Schillinger, who is a second year chemistry student, um, who is hoping to go to Pitt uh, School of Medicine. So maybe she'll get one of those butterflies that we're trying to get the funds secured for one of these when she uh, matriculates. Um, but she mentioned that she's had chronic tendon issues uh, related to dance training, which of course is near and dear to my heart, having two dancers in my household. Uh, so mm -hmm. thought of using this in, in a peds population, any concerns? Um. Uh, you know, based on what I know about tendon, um, tendon is pretty much, you know, matured by the age, um, uh, pediatric age. But, you know, it's interesting that pediatric patient population tends to have um, different weak link between muscle, tendon, bone junction in that because the bone is immature, pediatric patient tends to suffer from a condition called the traction apophysitis which is strictly speaking, not a tendon injury, between muscle, tendon, and bone. In adults, that area that gets frequently injured is either muscle or tendon. 
because those are softer compared to mature bone. But in pediatric populations, especially those in the 15s and 14 age group, bone is still the weakest link between those three different structures. So you're actually more likely to have overuse injury. And what happens is that tendon is stronger than bone. So then tendon will pull and start peeling the bone away. And that results in more of like uh, inflammation on the bony structure rather than tendon structure because weakest link is the bone. Um, so, you know, um, application for pediatric population, maybe uh, the reality of strictly speaking tendonitis might preclude from us studying, you know, this population as a first trial. I don't really think it's completely out, outside of, uh, you know, consideration, but um, I think that the most reasonable population to study are those, you know, uh, college and then beyond athletes who, who are skeletally mature, who are likely to sustain tendon injury as opposed to bone injury. Um, so I don't know. Uh, to answer the question, it, it, it's, it's very difficult to tell you, um, you know, what would be difference between adult and, you know, pediatric population. Certainly a reasonable thing to consider, but we don't really know what it does to the traction of orthosis that is more commonly suffered by pediatric patients. Sure, sure, yeah. So switching gears a little bit, um, there's a question from Christy Hensel, who's one of our own alumni, um, and she asked a very, a very uh, provocative question. So can you identify trigger points with ultrasound, and can you differentiate referred pain to the tendon from those trigger points? So the example she gives is like if you're looking at someone who had calf pain and trying to differentiate gastroc trigger points from Achilles. Gastric trigger points from Achilles uh, injury? Tendinopathy, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I guess, you know, the way that I evaluate this is I will look at uh, tendon first. And if tendon, you know, cl first clinical examination kind of tells you whether it's tendon problem or not, because, you know, Achilles tendon is located a little bit more distally or toward the heel bone, whereas, you know, the muscular structure is more toward the knee area. So the location kind of gives it off. But sometimes the patient is, you know, in, you know, maybe inconsistently is describing the location pain and it becomes un inconclusive. Then I usually use a process of elimination and I look at the tendon with various ultrasound modalities, various imaging modalities, uh, B mode ultrasound, elastography, which measures the stiffness of the oculus tendon. Um, there's um, a new uh, software called the spur microvascular imaging, uh, which allows us to look at the inflammation of the tendon. And if those three things kind of check off and then it's strongly arguing against the Achilles tendon being inflamed, then maybe I will consider, um, um, you know, uh, trigger point or the muscle um, as a potential diagnosis. Um, and trigger point is interesting uh, we don't really have a great understanding of how that trigger point comes on, but my experience is that trigger point is generally secondary to compensatory movement patterns. Uh, it's as a result of muscle uh, being tight or guarded in response to painful structure nearby, in this mm -hmm. case, the calf muscle. So I will look for the reason for the muscle to develop trigger point or a tightness in the muscle. So I usually don't go after the trigger point and I have been pretty successful without treating the trigger point. When I treat trigger point, it comes back. It just mm -hmm. tends to come back. You so, don't treat the trigger, the, trigger, yeah. the trigger of the trigger point, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we are looking for trigger over the trigger points. Exactly. Yeah. Hopefully that answered the question. Yeah, right okay. So um, so Brian Higdon, one of our current fellows, um, asked a question that, that I'm, I'm very excited about him asking, and that is uh, using ultrasound for adaptive sports athletes um, and specific findings that you'd be looking for in that population and, and how that might change your management. And of course, as we look to build our own, um, uh, enhance our own adaptive sports program, I think that this is a very timely question. So thoughts on that? Yeah, I really think there's a huge application for ultrasound uh, for uh, adaptive sports athletes. Uh, if you take an example of, you know, uh, wheelchair athletes, shoulder joint suddenly becomes your weight-bearing joints, and traditional 
lessons that we learn uh, for you know medical board examination is for uh, wheelchair users we got to treat uh, shoulder injuries a little bit more aggressively just because it affects their you know activity or daily living ability to go through the days um, and you know time to diagnosis um, is such an important part if we had employed a traditional you know sports medicine adaptive sports medicine model then typically these wheelchair athletes come into your clinic complaining of shoulder pain and we'll do clinical exam and a clinical exam is not 100 percent certain what might be causing the problem then we'll get an x-ray x-ray shows nothing about the bone problems or joint problems because that's the only thing we can see on an x-ray then we go on to get an mri and at the time between x-ray initial visit to mri result would be as long as sometimes two weeks and two weeks is a long time for someone not to be able to transfer themselves from a wheelchair to the bed and back. Um, whereas if you had an ultrasound and if we have the competency in caring, um, you know, adaptive sports athletes who are at risk of a shoulder injury because they use it more, then we could use ultrasound to make a diagnosis during the first visit instead of waiting for MRI two weeks later to decide what to do. And it may be that it's something that we can see on the first visit using ultrasound. Oh, there's a tendonitis, there's a partial tear, a rotator cuff, and maybe you can actually provide point of care procedures such as plate rich plasma injection or prolotherapy injection to alleviate the symptom pain and begin the process of healing during the first visit instead of waiting for two weeks to get yeah, the it's, it's a huge issue, um, and it's, it's even particularly more timely in this patient population, which, as, as you allude to, not only do they need that, that shoulder and that example to get back to their sport, but they need that function for daily activities, propelling them, you know, using their wheelchair transfers, et cetera. So really timely diagnosis is even more critical um, in that patient population. Mm -hmm. um, a, 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 another question that came up, it's, it's anonymous, and it may be anonymous because it's a difficult one to answer. Okay. <laughs> um, I like you that. could comment on reimbursement and insured coverage for various ultrasound-guided procedures because many of them currently are out of pocket and prohibitive for many patients who might benefit. Uh, the question is, is, is um, one more time, sorry. The reimbursement and insurance coverage for many of the ultrasound-guided procedures. So I think UPMC is unique because, you know, a great majority of my patients are within the HMO uh, UPMC network. So it might be a little bit different outside, um, but I've never really encountered a problem with, um, you know, reimbursement uh, perspective, especially if that results in potentially skipping on the MRI cost. And if it results in more of a timely uh, management of injury um, during the first visit, as opposed to adding two, three former visits with, you know, um, family members, work obligations. It's increasingly more difficult for people to take time off. Um, and ultrasound can sometimes offer a safe uh, cutting corner uh, ability to uh, make a diagnosis. So to answer the question, I, I don't, I've, I've never really had an issue with reimbursement uh, in terms of justification of use of ultrasound. Um, and typically use this as an extension of clinical examination, clinical examination, history taking, listening to the patient carefully, um, pretty much gives me 90% uh, confidence what this might be. But sometimes, um, you know, seeing, like I said, is believing and diagnosis can change. It, taking an example of shoulder pain, uh, even today I saw an individual coming in with uh, clinical symptoms presentation most consistent with rotator cuff tendonitis. But uh, for uh, medical students, education purposes, I put the transducer over the shoulder and lo and behold, I find a calcification was in the rotator cuff and that changes the management. Um, so you know, I think that I, I've been rewarded and I've never had a difficulty justifying or fighting that sort of reimbursement uh, battle with the insurance company for uh, my indication using ultrasound in clinical practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Um, so maybe uh, get one last question in, um, and, and that's from uh, one of our faculty colleagues, Dr. Wittenberg, who asked about the mechanism of tendon injury in and of itself. And 
as someone like yourself, who I know is well versed in mechanobiology and all of the different inter interacting components, how would you how would you answer that? Is it mechanical strain? Is it inflammation? Is it all of the above? How, how do you think about that? <laughs> There's so many ways tendon can become unhappy, uh, and one of the more common injury, uh, more common pathways, age related degeneration. And many people think that age-related stiffening or scar formation is the same process as overuse injuries more commonly suffered by athletes. But uh, their, their disease process seems to be to separate. So at least there are two different ways that you know, scar tissue forms within the tendon. One age-related, maybe oxygen radical-related, not sure. The other one is related to um, overuse. And... Overuse is difficult to define in human because there's really no way for us to really precisely uh, quantify how much stress tendon is undergoing. But in animal studies like Dr. James Wayne does, we know that, uh, for example, 4% uh, of stretching with the original tendon lengths is actually uh, stimulating for tendon and that results in activation of uh, stem cells in a tendon. So it actually repairs tendon by stressing them. Mechanical stretch actually repairs it. But if you go farther than that, let's say 8% stretch, then that actually destroys the tendon and uh, forms scar tissue. So, you know, everything in moderation, <laughs> you know, whether it's, you know, um, running uh, or working hard, um, everything in moderation seems to be good and tendon much, uh, very much behaves the same way. Uh, seem like hopefully that answers the question. So the process by which tendon gets injured uh, is also the exact process by which tendon repairs itself. So inactivity for patients um, is really never recommended for tendon injuries. Um, to put someone in a boot for Achilles tendonitis, patella tendonitis, if it's really not torn, but just the inflammation may slow down the healing. Mm -hmm. So I almost never tell patient, don't do this, don't do that. I think the art of medicine is keeping people, you know, as active as they can safely be uh, while we do our job to heal and return them to activity they are passionate about. Spoken as a true physiatrist. Absolutely. Maybe we, we, we can end on that one. I'll just mention in case you didn't see it in the chat that uh, Hiroshi from Japan uh, said, see you in Tokyo 2021. So. <laughs> oh man, sounds so, good. Awesome. So there's been a lot, of, a lot of great dialogue here, a lot of great questions, which obviously shows the interest and enthusiasm uh, that our group had. Um, perhaps I'll, I can turn this back over to Andy uh, to wrap up for us. Um, and, and there are some additional questions um, and, and Andy can help in facilitating getting those answered for you, particularly related to the metformin. So I think everyone is just as excited as you are, uh, Dr. Anishi, about the metformin study. So, so Andy, I'll turn it back over to you to wrap up. Great, great. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Anishi, Dr. Soa, thank you so much for uh, such an informative presentation and discussion. Uh, as was mentioned, if uh, there was a question we were unable to get to today, I'll work to get those answered for you. Uh, if you think of additional questions or you'd like to learn about ways to support the initiatives of the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, uh, please do contact me at raz37 at pit.edu. Uh, Dr. Soa, Dr. Anishi, thank you again. And to everyone who joined us tonight, please be on the lookout for future sessions of Rehab Reels. And I hope everyone has a good evening. <laughs>